Very good morning. It is Thursday the 3rd of June. Hope you're doing well and great for those who joined us last night for the latest masterclass and if you're not aware of what that is, it's basically when I get people from industry from a variety of different positions and they come in and speak to the community about their area of specialism, a bit about the, their background, the way they look at markets. So do feel free to check that out at AmplifyLive.com. Otherwise, in terms of the briefing this morning, uh, certainly we can have a look at the meme stocks, a couple of the cryptocurrencies, all of which have been moving with some degree of uniformity yesterday uh, as we saw the likes of AMC seeing some ridiculous gains. Um, so have a quick review of that and then we'll look at the broader asset classes which we're looking at here of which from an overall sentiment perspective relatively quiet here at the open uh, stock index futures and t-notes pretty flat but starting to see a little bit of an uptick in the dollar some quite large fluctuations in fact in the greenback yesterday initially surging out of the gate and then reversing course throughout the um, European afternoon to finish pretty much square and so some reflective quite seesaw price activity in euro dollar and cable from yesterday as you can see by that kind of v shape here in the top left um, charts however as europe has come in this morning the dollar's just picked up a little bit of pace trading up just shy of two tenths of one percent in the dixie just weighing a touch on the precious metal space gold and silver looking a little uh, more heavy this morning um, otherwise wci crude is the other um, key one it continues to hold on to some of its relative gains up about 45 cents and we'll have a look at those charts uh, again in a moment so let's just delve straight into the close on wall street last night and it was a fairly fairly benign close in fact and um, we only finished up roughly around 0.1 to 0.2 percent across the major three u.s indices and relatively quiet in follow through in the asia pacific session overnight um, but um, one of the companies and just have a look at some of the single stock stuff to start with on the heat map yesterday it was quite interesting because kind of more cyclical based um, areas were outperforming so energy real estate financials all outperformed um, tesla was a quite a key underperformer so let's start there and then we'll talk about some of these other meaningful individual single stock movers and the reason why i was just looking at tesla is finding a bit of support around uh, a fairly significant key technical area of support you can see this kind of these two lines here around six hundred dollars uh, a share providing a bit of a floor to price yesterday and that's been a meaningful area kind of in uh, inflection point for the stock price to react to on prior occasions so be interested to see how they perform and um, they did finish down they underperformed the market as i said the the broader indices finished up marginally tesla was actually down about three percent yesterday um, their reports from Credit Suisse about the company's market share declining and also a report coming out of the Wall Street Journal talking about Elon Musk was warned um, twice about his tweeting activity um, last year by the authorities. And so the market share thing, I wouldn't put too much weight in. Um, most analysts are of the belief that, you know, given the current period of the reopening that we're in, looking at market share volatility and fluctuation month to month, um, is probably more erratic now given the situation that we're confronting at the moment in time but nonetheless uh, quite a key technical area here uh, on Tesla that might be worth keeping an eye on going forward um, otherwise yeah let's just flip over to the meme stocks um, Eddie and I did a did a good uh, or had a good conversation yesterday which you can access on the Amplify Trading YouTube channel if you just look for the ANC pump explained and you'll be able to get a bit more rationale behind it but without going too much in the details uh, this is looking at the the kind of meme stocks so amc the black line which is a spectacular outperformer and then gamestop bed bath and beyond and some of the other names as well um, but um, at one point yesterday gamestop shares were up 127 percent um, they closed up 92% total gains for the year now at 3,000% at one point. And that does mean then, uh, I thought this was quite a, uh, a somewhat ridiculous chart to put it in a bit of context in terms of what that means for the market cap of AMC. It's roughly uh, about the same size as Delta Airlines or Tyson Foods, if you're aware of those companies in the U.S., um, which puts it pretty much as a median market cap of your average S&P 500 company. Uh, so it's gone from bas basically a, a median market cap of a Russell stock um, 
prior to 2021 to then now cutting the mustard in the, the main S&P 500. But of course, I say this in jest because this is not going to last uh, at this point. Um, so yeah, pretty crazy. Um, actually, there was one interesting index that I thought uh, I wasn't aware of, uh, and I'm not sure if you could openly track this, but I was looking at something called the index uh, that Goldman Sachs runs that basically tracks changes in the shares of companies most frequently mentioned on the kind of Reddit Wall Street Bets page. Uh, and their index was up more than 25% yesterday and it's up 60% over the course of the past two weeks. But I guess really, I mean, that's kind of main uh, Wall Street trying to kind of conceptualize what's going on, on Reddit. I mean, you could just read Reddit. I mean, uh, I don't think you really need too much percentage index derived figures to then ascertain how much it's getting mentioned at that point in time but nonetheless I thought it was quite interesting um, otherwise in terms of overnight in Asia a um, few things to be aware of one was the Chinese Cajun services PMI it did slow down a touch but still a firm expansionary territory 55.1 against 56.2 not looking for any reaction this morning though to seep into European markets didn't really even impact the domestic scene overnight and then US President Biden is to amend former President Trump's blacklist to target key industries and is likely to sign an order this week that intends to crack down on investment in Chinese defense and surveillance technology sectors, according to sources, as a report released overnight. So again, I don't expect that to have too much of an impact at the open here, if anything at all. But one of the things that it does show is that, as we've been discussing of late, uh, the Biden administrative stance on um, China is going to remain pretty firm at this point. And as we've said, uh, Piers and I, and I think at last week's podcast, there's definitely agenda priorities here for Biden, of which our feelings are that there's going to be much more domestic focused as we go into the kind of midterms in a year's time and how it's going to be more about getting the US back on its feet, people back employed. Uh, and so that means that China's kind of kept at arm's length. And the risk, I guess, the tail risk for markets is a mismanagement of that kind of um, keeping that dialogue open, but also keeping the pressure on, because obviously this is a political point as well that he'll want to bring back home in terms of the stance against China. So it's a fairly delicate situation, but what's happening right now and, and further kind of blacklisting, if you like, of defense and surveillance technology sectors in China um, is kind of, I guess, just continuation of the general approach that's been happening. So I don't find it too unnerving at this point. Um, and it does run alongside ongoing dialogue. So um, yeah, not too much um, to look at right now, but again, something to be, to be mindful of. Um, the other thing that came out last night, and it's something which I'd wanted to cover because some of you might not even be aware of this stuff, but you know, outside of normal monetary policy tools, if you like, whether they be traditional like rates, <coughs> unconventional like QE, um, I know QE gets all the talking um, kind of spotlight, if you like, because of the fact that we're getting close to the discussion about tapering and so on, and that's the sequencing of policy kind of normalization. But there were a whole batch of liquidity mechanisms that were put into place to avoid then any uh, or to allow the system to function through that difficult period of adjustment when we went through the initial pandemic phase. And one of the things that came out last night was that is this article here. And it's basically saying the Fed will begin to unwind the corporate bond holdings that it acquired last year through an emergency lending facility launched to calm the credit markets at the height of the pandemic. The Fed said the sale of the holdings in the secondary market corporate credit facility. So this is, remember, there's all these acronyms. I think there was 11 or 14 in total of different liquidity inducing kind of programs. But the SMCCF, which includes corporate bonds purchase in the secondary market and exchange traded funds that invest in corporate bonds would be gradually and orderly in terms of, uh, again, the sale of those holdings. The question here then, well, how much have they got to sell? And actually, it's very small. The point being is that this facility was hardly used. If you remember many months ago, I had a graphic of all these facilities and it was kind of like, this is how much they've been willing to do and this is how much it's actually been used. And it was a fractional amount. You know, this is one thing that definitely I recognize going back to 
um, the European sovereign crisis. If you remember those who were trading then, it was that fateful day when Ma Super Mario came out and basically said, we will do whatever it takes. And mark my words, you know, he means that. That's what he, he kind of said at the time. And I remember there was liquidity related mechanisms that were put in place then, which were never actually used. So it was his words with putting forward these programs was trying to then instill confidence, credibility that in fact the central bank would follow through with that commitment to do whatever it takes. And it was kind of the same with the Fed. It's this over, you know, kind of delivery of, of all of these, these measures that will be taken to safeguard the system. So then the market actually never even needs to use them confidence is already reinstilled and the market starts to recover and that was largely the same case with a lot of these liquidity programs given the, the how quickly the pandemic kind of struck the market uh, and it could have been a, a tangible risk of course to liquidity so in actual amounts the facility had 13.8 billion of loans outstanding 8.6 billion of corporate bond etf holdings and about 5.2 billion of corporate bonds that need to be kind of unwound uh, the Fed intends to sell the full portfolio by the end of the year. So to me, that's of no real impact on the market. I mean, that's an incredibly small readjustment at that point. Um, it will start selling its ETF soon and begin offloading its corporate bond holdings later in the summer. But again, as I said in summary, I don't really see this having much of an impact. But again, it, it does mark the first road to the Fed gearing itself up to the readjustment of, of some degree of normality and, and, and stepping off some of these programs, of which is to be expected, I would say. This isn't anywhere near as big as the idea about tapering and those types of more directly active things that people are looking at in the market. Um, the other thing then is the oil infantries last night. Um, we did have a fairly sizable drawdown, actually. So, you know, just more ammunitions on the headline for the bulls at the moment as we continue the, the pass towards 70 bucks in front month crude futures. Um, Cushing though was a build as was gasoline at two and a half million. But look, let's have a look at the oil chart. And <clears throat> you know, this is a picture from, from really last week to where we're at at the moment. And we've continued this move higher. Um, I did also read this morning that as far as Iran, talks have been adjourned until the 10th. So about another seven days time. Um, much of the commentary coming out of both sides of the negotiating table is still that there's a lot of work to be done. So as we've been emphasizing before, um, I wouldn't be expecting any deal to be brokered anytime soon. And consequently, then the return of supply um, not happening as quickly as perhaps people were thinking a few weeks ago when oil was, was moving a little lower at the time. So that's kind of positive further reopening positive data um, that comes out is going to be more positive on the demand side keeping on that ongoing vaccine situation as well and also with some of that emerging market risk particularly India you'll recognize it's really not in the headlines a great deal after it was really dominating things two weeks ago such as the media's intention to report only bad news the point being that cases have been declining so it's no longer something that editors want to run, but that's a positive sign, you know, that they're, they're kind of over the hump in that respect, albeit there's some regions, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, these kind of areas that still need monitoring at this point in time. But things still remaining pretty bullish for, for oil. We obviously had the OPEC meeting as well earlier this week, and they kind of just stuck to their guns. And, you know, we've been looking at this for a, for a while. We still see kind of 70 bucks as the next obvious target, uh, and seemingly we're on that on that on our way at this point in time right around 75 cents short of that psychological kind of marker once we get to 70 bucks given the fact that we have risen if you're looking here on a daily chart fairly consistently through the breakthrough of that previous year to date high to trade at this highest level since 2018 i wouldn't be surprised to see a bit of a hiatus profit taking and therefore pullback and some consolidation after hitting that target um, not unless we got something new um, in terms of the news um, sphere coming out to, to really move things in either direction. Um, while we're here, before we look at the calendar, quick look across these charts then. Um, as I said, a bit of a dollar pickup as European players have come back in. Um, nothing really too much of a great deal of interest that I'm looking at here in the euro for the time being. Um, on this decline, we've had a bit of a, a top 
um, eked out late in the US session and during Asia Pacific hours. We're back below pivot and 122 handle this morning. If we move any lower, perhaps that kind of previous area here um, comes into play, which would be 121.88. And then below there, that, that lower kind of rectangle I've got marked up, which would be um, the low from where we had 19th, we test 21st, did break through it momentarily on 28th last Friday, uh, and then we bounced off there in yesterday's session. So um, Euro, again, levels I'll be looking at. For cable, I, yeah, I did see a couple of big banks come out and try to explain the sell-off in cable that we've had materialize over the previous 48 hours. Um, and, and I don't want to get into that game of trying to curve fit then a narrative to the sell-off because ultimately the dollars kind of flip-flopped and I don't think there is any real fundamental change of catalyst to create that movement. It's just happening and I think you've just got to trade what you see in, uh, in that respect. But I think here, a couple of things that were, were interesting uh, on the reversal, on the pickup that we saw um, as the dollar faded those gains yesterday afternoon. Um, ni nice um, kind of technical response to the 50% fib from that relative high to low from earlier this week with also the daily pivot level on the futures and that acted as a nice cap for price and now we've started to drift back down lower. Um, we've just broken back below pivot this morning so technically quite interesting that was an area that was holding uh, on the retest after we broke high yesterday afternoon was a previous area of support as well on some prior occasions um, so it'd be interesting to keep, to keep an eye on probably take that off and so therefore on the downside not a great deal of support here till we get back down to yesterday's low um, overall again fundamentally I don't really see a lot going on here in terms of sterling in the UK perspective um, either from Covid lockdown or the Bank of England so I'd be looking at relative kind of ranges here um, so perhaps not that much interest until we get a bit lower down uh, for me personally um, otherwise, a uh, bit of dollar pickup has just weighed a little bit on the precious metals, as I said earlier at the beginning of the briefing, and that has just led to initial test on that low point. That was quite a key area um, for gold. I was just talking about that um, very early before I started the briefing in the community, uh, and this was that, that level around 1903. It's been quite key for near-term price action. You can see we tapped on it a few times yesterday for the eventual break higher came back, tested it, tested it again this morning, and the breakdown, you can see markets traded heavy straight down to the S1 and the $1,900 handle here. Next level on the downside, uh, be keeping an eye beyond that point of the handle at 1896 spot seven, which would be the lower bound of the price activity that we're seeing intraday yesterday. Um, silver, likewise below pivot following suit and just declining at the moment amid some of these recent moves. Equity indices, not really going to comment on, not a great deal of interest going on there. Uh, so let's move straight on to the calendar uh, and look to wrap things up. So calendar-wise, um, we've already got all the overnight stuff. So then the service PMI numbers coming out um, later on this morning from Europe and the UK. These are final readings, so not anticipating much in a way of a, a market reaction to that. Um, very much a US-centric session. One thing yesterday was despite some of the FX fluctuations, Yesterday was very quiet because the calendar really had no major things going on. Today's a little bit different. It's definitely a US focus. Uh, we've got really three major readings coming out. ADP National Employment, which will act no doubt as still, despite its inability to really accurately predict the jobs report we saw last month, people will still look to it for guidance for how we might perform on the jobs data tomorrow. And that's expected at 650 from previous 742, so that's at 115, followed 15 minutes after by initial jobless claims, which is expected to show further improvements to 390,000 from 406, so that positive trend continuing. Uh, and then we get the ISM services PMI, which last time showed actually a very strong employment constituent. The pace of job creation quickened to the highest um, level since September of 2018 in the service figure last month we are expecting a continuation of a fairly solid number at 63 here's what the data kind of looks like for the ism non-manufacturing pmi so 63 puts us up here and this is very reflective this is kind of 
uh, March, April, and obviously May, we'll see today, of this period of, because of the speed of vaccinations in the US, allowing further reopenings, and that should definitely feed through, one would imagine, into the service sector uh, kind of figure. Other than that, you get the oil inventories. Remember, a slightly later time of 4 p.m. instead of regular 3.30. And this is always the case when it's delayed a day due to the Memorial Day holidays in the U.S. on Monday. Speaker-wise, Fed's boss Dick, the only voting member speaking at 5.30. Uh, and then Kaplan Harker, non-voter speaking later on. Oh, in fact, you do have uh, Qualls speaking as well at 8 p.m. Um, this evening. Bank of England's Bailey speaks at an IMF event on the financial sector. Uh, we've kind of heard from Bailey a lot in recent weeks, so I'm not expecting too much there, to be quite honest, but it's 5 p.m. Uh, and then supply out of Spain, France, and a three 10-year note and 30-year bond auction announcement coming out in terms of the sizes from the U.S. Treasury at 4 p.m. Uh, so that is it. That's your wrap. Um, again, feel free to contact me either um, in the Discord room. Obviously, you're getting this early. Uh, it's going out it's after 7 a.m. If you're watching this delayed on YouTube, feel free to leave a comment. Remember to like and subscribe on the channel. Uh, and don't forget, you can access this particular briefing early for free at AmplifyLive.com. All right, with that, have a good day, guys. See you tomorrow.